It's very difficult to see why music should have evolved because music doesn't fossilize. But it seems to me that one very good candidate capacity for underpinning our complex sociality is the emergence of music, which might put music back to the origin of our species. It might be that humans and music co-evolved. It could, of course, be that music is something that comes once we're human. I suspect, however, music gave us a bit of a kickstart in getting to being human. Are we the only species that is musical? Are humans uniquely musical? I think the answer is yes. Uh, people certainly would claim that we're the only linguistic species. And I think that we are the only musical species as well. And I'm not alone in claiming this. Other animals certainly make beautiful and complicated sounds, bird songs, whale songs, and so forth. But they don't have the characteristics that we think of as music because they tend to be produced in very specific contexts for very specific purposes. Bird song, for example, occurs at certain seasons, certain times of day, related to certain hormonal changes in the brain, serves a very specific function having to do with defending a territory or attracting a mate, is typically only made by males. And these sorts of features are quite different from what we think of as human music, where both men and women make music, we make it from a young age, we don't have to be, do it at certain times of day or certain times of year, we can do it on any number of occasions for a, a huge variety of functions. I, mean, I think music, as we commonly think of the term, is uniquely human. I'm going there to see my father. He said he'd meet me, meet me when I come. A great deal of the neuroimaging data shows that human beings are musical, able to respond to the music of their culture, even if they've not studied music uh, very seriously. Uh, anthropologically, we know that all human beings in all societies all over the world in any time and place that we know anything at all about have engaged in artistic behaviors in general and music behaviors specifically. There's a literature that suggests that before we learn to speak, we engage in a whole range of music-like behaviours. For example, um, babbling is a precursor to speech, and if you listen to infants babble, it's, it's quite musical. They experiment with pitch, so they do glide and, and squealy noises. Just like the skill of language that we all develop from a young age. We also have the capacity to develop musically. I think the difference is though that when we're growing up we're all surrounded by everyone speaking all the time and we're required to do that and engage and so we all become expert at language if you like. <laughs> Whereas in music, if you're not in a musical program from a young age or exposed to a, a strong musical environment, then you may not go on to develop your skills to the same level. However, if you are, um, as in the case of a musician, then that shows that, in fact, you can. It's very clear, if you look at a population, that some people are very good at some aspect of music, be it performance or composition or singing or whatever, and some people are very bad. So there's clearly a very great difference in achievement within a population. And the question really is, what causes that? Now, some people have the view that there are innate differences between one person and another, which actually explain why one person is good and another person is not so good. And that innate difference has been called talent. And it's held to be something that you're born with, doesn't really alter. Of course, it can be helped by development, but basically, you either have it or you don't. So according to this view, there are two kinds of people in the world, the innately talented, which is a small minority, and the rest, which is untalented. And the question really is, does science actually provide any evidence to support that view? In my humble opinion, no. <laughs> There are very many uh, explanations for why people might differ one from another in their final achievement. One thing that we certainly know is that this is very culturally specific. There are other cultures than the Western industrialized culture 
in which we inhabit, where the differences in musical accomplishment between individuals are much less. And everybody in those cultures has a much higher base level of musical accomplishment. And we're thinking, for example, of some of the tribal cultures of Africa. <laughs> Lenda tribe in South Africa, for example, are pre-literate, so they don't have reading and writing. They certainly have language, but they inculcate the mores, which is a fancy way of saying they, they raise up children into the way of becoming an adult member of society, primarily through singing and dancing. Now, they couldn't do that if only the, uh, the special talented few could learn to do that. They do that because virtually every child learns to sing and to dance and thus to become a member of the society and to contribute equally uh, and to grow and develop in that way. When you look at many traditional cultures, you find that music is something that everyone's expected to do, everyone's expected to engage with and engage in. Um, you also find that it's recognized some people will be better than others. Some people are rubbish at it, some people can't dance. But it doesn't stop them trying. In fact, many cultures do try to engage with music is really the only way to be wholly social within that culture. If you, if you don't do it, you're, you're actually being rude. Ideas of music facilitating group cohesion and social cohesion in for example, small tribal situations is a part of the explanation as to why we might have evolved musical abilities. But there's also the mother-infant developmental research that shows that it's a very natural thing for mothers to sing to their infants and this seems to be very important in developing the mother-infant or parent-infant bond. To physically survive, a baby must feed, but to feed they must find their mother's nipple, to do that they must find the breast, to locate the breast they must find the mother, and to find the mother they must they use their ears. They hear their mother's voice as part of that chain to survival, and that begins in utero. The mother's voice, of course, is the most present sound in the um, uterine environment, and, and that gives them that linchpin beginning to uh, survive once, once they are born. One of the, the cues to all this would be uh, what's sometimes called motherese speech. So when you speak to a baby, the words don't mean anything, but the prosodic elements, that is the expressive elements, mean a lot. So I could say, you are an ugly baby, and even though the words aren't very positive, the melodic contour, the rhythmicity, the timbre, the inflections, the phraseology, all of those things express a positive thing to the baby. And we find then, for example, that lullabies are absolutely ubiquitous. All human societies, mothers use lullabies as a way of not just calming the baby, but, but bonding in such a way that there is rapport back and forth between mother and infant. And so uh, we may be wired as a mechanism until we acquire language to learn to be a human being, to express emotions, to, to share back and forth with another human being. Because again, human beings are, are wired to be social creatures, not, we don't live in isolation. Well. Professional musicians often report a strange tinkling experience in the fingers whenever they listen to music that they know how to play, that, that like a well-trained piece of music. It's almost as if uh, their fingers have some kind of a free wheel all of a sudden. We believe that what's going on in the 
brain whenever you listen to music that you know how to play it's something um, that has to do with the special relationship between the auditory and the motor system in the brain it's not like there's a music center um, this is your music spot you know in scanning research um, depending on the particular task you'll see um, a range of areas activated and these areas form networks so for example if we're thinking about listening to music if you turn on the radio and you hear your favorite song parts of the temporal lobes in the brain will be active then also in the middle temporal gyrus is an area that's now being increasingly found to be involved in familiar tune identification so if you like it's your musical jukebox <laughs> that you pull out a song and say oh yes I know that one it's your music lexicon we also know then if you're going to then hold that song in mind and sing along to that you might also activate some frontal areas more anterior areas to the temporal lobe and that's important in working memory if you were playing you'd obviously also have motor areas involved in for example keyboard movements um, if you were reading music you'd have areas at the back of the brain the occipital lobe that are important in visual processing and if you were reading a musical score areas in the parietal region that interpret the spatial relationships between the notes you're also processing the music emotionally and so you're going to have areas in the limbic system of the brain which is right in the middle of the brain that are actively processing the emotional part so really it's it's a very um, an extensive network and, a, and um, quite comprehensive in terms of brain coverage for want of a better word of course the whole brain is working uh, into any kind of musical activity just because all those components are involved at every particular moment so you can compare it to a symphony orchestra or a sport team so whatever kind of uh, activity that requires many different um, contributions at the same time <laughs> In so many ways we've become a spectator society and, and so I wouldn't separate music necessarily from other things but it's, but it's true across the board where we sit and watch other people play sports for us and we pay a lot of money for other people to play sports for us where if we all got out and, and continued to be actively involved in sports throughout our lifetime we'd be much better off for it. And so yes, the, very much the same thing is true in music where those individuals who start making music very early on and continue to be active in music making throughout the lifespan <clears throat> certainly have much to gain from it from those who never did it or did it and, and stopped and now are only spectating. If you go to a funeral, there are almost always words spoken and music performed. And if we could say everything we wanted to say and express in words, we wouldn't need the music. But likewise, if we could express everything we want to do about the music, we wouldn't need the words. Both are necessary because they, they get into realms that the others either can't do at all or don't do as well. So if we're speaking about the individual, we might need words to describe when this person was born, what this person's occupation was or what their life was like and specific details. Language is very good about that. And we also can use language to express, in this particular case, the notion of life and death and if it's in a religious context, the meaning of, of life and so on. But there's something very powerful about the music which does that in a way that words cannot do. And so rather than seeing them as 
either two different versions of the same thing or of opposites. I see them as complementary. That is, they both share some commonalities, but they both go in directions that the other can't go. Walk down that lonesome road all by yourself. Don't turn your head back over your shoulder and only stop to rest yourself when the silver moon is shining high above the trees. The old uh, kind of popular view is that language is more of a left brain thing and music is more of a right brain thing and we're just discovering that's terribly oversimplified and that both music and language use both sides of the brain. There are differences of course but they're more subtle. If I had stopped to listen once or twice If I had closed my mouth and opened my eyes We've recently been doing a neuroimaging study looking at this issue What we did was we took a group of singers and non-singers, some very high performing operatic singers and then those who are less able to sing and we gave them a language task in the scanner and we gave them a singing task. We also gave them a task where they had to recite words with no pitch. And when we looked at the pattern of findings we found some really interesting effects. Firstly we found that all of the individuals use their left hemisphere to, to speak and, in, and do the language task which is very typical in what we see in many studies. What we found that was interesting was that the non-singers, they use both their left and their right hemisphere to do the singing task. And the areas that they used were shared or similar between the language and the singing networks that were activated. So the experts, however, what they did was actually show far less at overlap singing and language networks. So they weren't singing with their language network, they had their own developed network just for singing in the left hemisphere. So what that really implies is that training actually allows you to develop this unique singing network and you know performers have talked for time immemorial about the idea that you really have to learn to find your voice. And, and singing with your language network is not finding your voice and that's what non-experts do whereas experts disconnect and develop this independent network with less overlap in the left hemisphere. If I had cooled my head and warmed my heart I and It's an example of the brain adapting to the environment that it's in and being plastic Plasticity is, is what we call it in a technical sense. Taking off the day all the over at all and the other spoon, but some of the others were further down uh, strong up. This is a picture of Sam's scan at 24 hours after he presented and the area that I'm pointing to here is a dark area that shows that there has been a stroke in this area of the brain. And this is one of the key areas responsible for language. And the interesting thing about music therapy is that we don't fully understand where music is in the brain, where it localises to in the brain. Uh, 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 um, uh, the Sam presented with mumbled speech. You couldn't comprehend anything that he was saying. But we found instantaneously with music that Sam sang beautifully. He was fluent. His favourite song just came out as if uh, so totally opposite for the way he was speaking. When the sun is smiling, surely it's like a morning's in the leaves of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. If you go into the realm of music therapy, I mean, then you have a vast arena of working with individuals who are 
visually impaired, who are hearing impaired, who are orthopedically handicapped, who are speech impaired. Uh, for example, melodic intonation therapy is a, is a technique that music therapists and speech therapists use with someone who's aphasic, which means they've lost their ability to speak. And under certain conditions, they basically learn to sing their speech. And so they might sing, I'd like a cup of coffee. And while that sound, you wouldn't speak that way, and that sounds very stilted, over time you could reduce that, the hills and valleys, to you know, approximate normal speech. Somebody come here, please. Somebody come here, please. It's beautiful. Now you just sing it. Somebody come here, please. Beautiful. And it was interesting in Sam that he responded so well to the music therapy. And it suggests to us at least that giving him music therapy was stimulating the other side of his brain and allowing the other side of the brain to perhaps take over some of the functions of the damaged left side of the brain, a process that we call neuronal plasticity. When I reach out and oh, the world seems very and when I say there's money, sure they steal your eyes. I heard your Irish accent. <laughs> it's again a classical teaching in neurology is to find cases who lose, uh, after a brain damage, of course, uh, most of their language abilities, but still remain very proficient in, in music. And this is the case of Shebalin, for example, who is well known for his musical productions that happened to be written after a second stroke that really destroyed the whole left hemisphere. And he was, he was speechless. He couldn't teach. Uh, he could no longer express himself by uh, language. He couldn't even understand language. And still, he continued to compose. And it was judged, you know, by people like Trostakovich that it was at the same level of quality as before the stroke. People have claimed that the music of Sir Edward Elgar sounds like British English speech somehow. Did you read the reviews this morning? No, I never read reviews. You should look the Oxford Unless they're Times. good. <laughs> well, the Oxford Times was, it, it was a bit... And the music of Claude Debussy sounds somehow like French spoken French, and obviously no one would ever confuse spoken French with piano music by Debussy. So, and yet somehow they're claiming that Debussy's music reflects the French language. Well, how is that possible? Uh, so this idea has been floating around for a while, but nobody had ever been able to provide empirical evidence for it. And we recently took advantage of some very nice work that linguists have been doing, showing, showing that you can measure rhythmic differences between languages in a scientific way um, by looking at the patterning and timing of syllables and consonants and vowels and showing, for example, that English and French are very different rhythmically. And so we, we took those tools and we applied them to instrumental music. It turned out that the same equations, the same mathematical equations that you can apply to language to show their rhythmic differences can be directly adapted to music, which is what we did. And we looked at uh, music of composers from around the turn of the century in England and France, the kinds of composers that people have said these, made these claims about. And uh, much to our delight, we found that the music differed in a way that reflected the language differences. And then we recently did this also with melody. So that is the, how the voice moves up and down in time and speech. The intonation of English is also different from the intonation of French, and that is also reflected in the music of these composers. Oh, well done. Much better than me. I need to practice a little bit. I think I need to warm up. This has been a really fun project because it, it shows how uh, we think it has to do with learning your native sound patterns which everybody does, but composers are particularly sensitive to the structure of sound patterns, and we think that what's happening is that they internalize them, just as everybody in their culture does, but then when they go to compose music, those patterns are there for them to draw on, either consciously or sub subconsciously, when they are trying to compose music that's particularly of their culture. Um, and so it's about how, how learning in one domain can influence another domain.
baby's preferences are very much uh, based on their mother's preferences. And so whatever music uh, mum's been listening to while she's been pregnant is the music that the baby's familiar with and the baby will respond to most. We often wonder about whether or not a baby knows a mother's voice and the answer to that is yes. They will recognise the mother's, their mother's voice, they'll recognise other significant voices, for instance siblings who might have been down around the region of the abdomen and they will be able to recognise those voices. Baby's kicking you at you tummy. Sometimes. Do you want to have a listen? Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Newborn babies can recognize sounds that come from their uh, fetal period. So, for example, their mother's voice is very familiar to them, and they like to turn their head towards their mother's voice. So, for example, if there are two persons speaking in the room, one is their mother and then another person, they tend to turn the head towards the mother's voice. Even if it's coming from the tape, and even if the mother is speaking a different language, so they can recognize their own mother's style of speaking. Hello, a little smile. Infants, even as early as one or two days old, and certainly within a matter of weeks, can, can respond to music and auditory stimulation uh, very much like adults do. Because they come into the world prepared to make sense of uh, what they hear. For example, one, of the, one phrase that's used is called auditory streaming. And that's simply used to describe how human beings can separate out different streams of sound. So if, if you were listening to the sound of my voice and there was also the sound of a, an ambulance going by and perhaps in the next room there's a television playing, you can separate those out into different auditory streams. If you couldn't, it would all jumble together and you wouldn't be able to make sense of that. Prematurely born infants, they have a higher risk for learning disabilities, especially related to language. So I come from Finland and in Finland we estimate that something like 40% of infants who were born extremely prematurely have actually problems in reading and writing at school. And that's a huge number because in normal population it's less than 10% or around 10%. So that's very much elevated. And we would like to know why that is. And there is one factor that is interesting of course is that uh, they have spent a lot of time in hospital in an intensive care unit first and then in a regular hospital and those months that they have spent there the others have spent with their mother in, in the uterus and they have been hearing their mother speaking maybe singing maybe listening to music and the prematurely born babies have just been hearing mostly these machines beeping in the hospital so this is a very different kind of acoustic environment What we're keen to do in uh, the ward, once a baby has been born, is to ensure that we organise the environment and keep it controlled and contained, both for the baby and for the family. We want to keep mum uh, calm when we can, so that she then engenders that same feeling to her baby. If mum is attending to the auditory environment, then she's starting to contain it and control it for her baby in a way that it, the baby can begin to predict and make use of sound rather than it always being a surprise and being random. So what we're trying to do then is to organise the auditory environment for the baby and minimise that kind of chaotic, uh, noxious, uh, random sound environment that they can be exposed to. Then, with that quietness as a base, we can then include organised sound, which in this case is usually music in some form or another, either with uh, mothers singing to their, to their babies or fathers singing to their babies or by using some recorded music which is carefully programmed. That's a lovely song. Singing is a, a, is a beautiful thing for a mother and a baby to share but it's not absolutely essential. What is essential is mum understands how important her voice is to her baby and how much her baby discriminates her voice as being nurturing and uh, providing safety. So what I'm doing is working with mums to help them understand their speaking voice, but then also their singing voice, 
or humming to their baby. Humming is also just as powerful as singing out loud can be. We did a, a study with a large number of young musicians a few years back trying to find what kind of factors in their very early lives would predict whether they would go on to high levels of um, accomplishment in their later lives. And we found one of the things that was very important was the age at which children sang their first recognizable song. Tinkle, tinkle, little star. And children who sang songs earlier tended to go on to achieve more. Now, how do you get to sing recognizable songs? It's because your parents sing them to you in these kind of back and forward games and you pick them up. We tinkle, tinkle, little star. How do you and you what you are? So it seems to suggest that parents who sing with and indulge in musical games with their very young children are actually setting them on the path to higher musical achievement in later life. A lot of people believe that it's been scientifically proved that if you play Mozart to your kid, it's going to improve their intelligence. This is actually based on a complete misconception of some research which was done by Francis Rauscher and colleagues about 10 years ago, where they played Mozart to adults while they were undergoing an intelligence test. And what they showed was that there was roughly a 10-minute jag. It increased their performance on certain aspects of that intelligence test. After 10 minutes, the effect wore off. The effect has never been shown with children. <laughs> Listening to music passively for a brief period of time is not going to have a long-term benefit of making someone smarter in other domains. However, if you get to a more sophisticated, more nuanced look in the question you just asked, does learning to play a musical instrument have an effect on intelligence? Much more difficult question to answer, and I think it's both yes and no, and we don't really know completely yet. What I can tell you, we know for sure, it's certainly the brain changes as a result of learning to play a musical instrument. I'll hasten to say that that's true of almost anything you do. If you learned to ride a bicycle, your brain will be different after you've learned to ride a bicycle than it was before, if you learned to play chess. So it's not nothing sacred about music. Everything we do as human beings changes the way the brain is, but particularly when you systematically rehearse and practice a particular learning experience over and over and over for many long periods of time, weeks and months and years, which you see in music, perhaps more so than many other things from early childhood on throughout. I did the study where I put an ad in a local newspaper for free arts lessons for six-year-olds. So we were trying to recruit families with six-year-olds and uh, we got lots and lots of phone calls as you might expect. And then uh, we interviewed them to make sure that they were serious about participating. So we told them what the study was about and said, told them that their uh, children would be in <clears throat> one of uh, four different conditions. One was taking keyboard lessons, keyboard music lessons. One was taking vocal music lessons. Uh, one was taking drama music lessons, uh, drama lessons, not music. And uh, fourth condition was no lessons, but they got actually got keyboard lessons the next year. And then, um, so we made sure that they were serious about participating. And then we had 144 of the families, 144 children, and we assigned them randomly to uh, one of those four conditions. And then we gave them a uh, IQ test, 
in the summer before first grade and before they began the lessons, and then in between first and second grade after the lessons. And everybody had an increase in IQ, which um, we know happens as a consequence of schooling, but the increase was larger in the um, music groups by about three points. The brain doesn't grow in a vacuum. So as this child is studying music from the age of five to the age of 20, um, it's not as if the brain is in a jar doing this experience asocially. This child is being raised in a home where the parents apparently feel that this is an important thing for them to do. And it's likely that those same parents think that mathematics and language and reading are also important things to do. So my guess is that you will find that children who come from homes where the parents support education, where they give the child advantages, of going to the library and reading books, of seeing plays, uh, not just sit there and watch television in a passive mode, but whether actively engaged in life across the board, I think you'll find that music is a very important, but not by any means the only important ingredient in, in raising a whole child. But there is a danger here, because in the school system where academic performance is really held to be very, very important and parents are very worried about their kids' maths grades and science grades and so on, music is kind of seen as a means to an end. Put your kid into a music program and it will improve their math score. And in doing that, it's devaluing the music itself. Because it's saying, don't worry about music for itself, just for whether it will improve your math score or not. Well, if you really want to improve children's math score, you give them better maths teachers. So anything you do in this impro, you just do from those notes, right? Straight 12 bar blues. One of the things which perhaps our music education system isn't very good at doing is encouraging creativity. Very often kids are given set pieces and their job is to copy them. And imagine what a furore there would be in art education if art teachers provided kids with uh, outline drawings and the task for the kid was to copy along with a piece of tracing paper. That would be considered to be anathema. What you do is you give a child a blank sheet of paper, lots of resources and tools, and see what they can make of it. But we are not very good at giving children blank sheets of musical paper in, in an analogous say and say, what can you do? What kind of music can you make? So some of the most interesting and innovative music education programs actually encourage children to compose. One of the features of contemporary music is that a lot of the music you'll hear is produced not using instruments but using a computer. Some of it might even be composed using a computer. One interesting development from this, however, is the attempt to develop computers that can interact with human beings. And one of my current graduate students has been exploring a part of this issue by getting people to tap along with each other or with a computer. A computer that mimics in many respects uh, the behavior of a, a real person tapping along. Now, the participants in this experiment don't know whether they're tapping with another human being or a computer. When they're tapping with another human being, they're tighter, more together, more accurate than they are when they're tapping with a computer, which suggests that humans have a kind of bias towards interactivity. We like to interact in time with something that will interact back. A bit of reciprocity is required. The computer, on the other hand, simply doesn't know we're there. It's just going to continue to produce this stream of signals. It's not interacting. It's an autistic individual. And we kind of block it out or find difficulty in coordinating with it because there's no give and take. It's all take and no give. With another human being, on the other hand, even something as simple as tapping along together demonstrates a degree of give and take that seems wholly natural to us.
if two people are walking down the street, assuming the height difference is not too extreme, and talking to each other, it, it's almost inevitable that they will be in step with each other. And it seems quite possible that we're about the only species that can do this sort of thing automatically and unconsciously. We can entrain to an external pulse. How does this come about? What is the link between us hearing this periodic sound and reorganizing our motor behavior around that pulse? is untalent. A lot of people walk around thinking that they don't have this thing called talent. And when you ask them to explain a little more about it, a lot of people say, well, I think I'm tone deaf. And then when you press them more and ask them, well, what do you mean by tone deaf? They usually say that there's something about singing. They can't sing, they can't sing in tune. People have told them that their voice isn't very nice and so on. And the question is, why? What's going on with people who can't sing? Now, one possibility is that there is something really deficient in the brain system which perceives music, that they can't actually hear music properly, so therefore they can't produce it. Work by Isabel Peretz and colleagues from the University of Montreal has really now led to the identification of congenital amusia as a, as a syndrome in its own right, which we might have originally called tone deafness, um, but you know, was a, a colloquial kind of layperson's definition for what now has been formally characterised and understood as congenital amusia. <laughs> I refer to it as congenital music because I believe there are different forms of musical disorders that are present from birth in the individual in the sense that they will never develop the musical abilities as most of the other people do. Uh, and Che Guevara was one of these cases. I mean, it's well documented. We all know him for his leftist revolutionary ideas and uh, he was also well educated. He came from a well educated family and uh, he was hopeless with music. I mean, it was well known that he was uh, in music. But what it tells us is that really, mu I mean, that music can be isolated among all the cognitive skills, that he didn't have that skill or that uh, those skills, I mean, the musical capacity, but he had everything else. These people who are walking around in society saying they're tone deaf have this dense perceptual problem. So we've been setting out to, to try and discover whether that's the case. And what we've actually found is that a large number of people who call themselves tone deaf score perfectly on Isabel Peretz's perceptual tests. So there's actually nothing wrong with their perceptual brain. So we're currently trying to find out, well, what is the actual problem? And it very often turns out to be a problem of vocal confidence some point in their lives, a teacher or some other adult has told them to shut up because they weren't producing the sound that uh, the teacher wanted to hear. And they've kind of internalized that as, I can't do this thing. And what we've discovered is that if you ask people to sing and you give them a very basic level of scaffolding, for example, playing or singing along with them, it can produce enormous improvements in what they're able to do. So what we think is that a lot of tone-deaf people are simply stuck at a level of development because they've never had the particular bit of help or encouragement to get one level up the ladder. But as soon as you put that bit of scaffolding back, they can in fact catch up. Well, one of the most important things we've discovered is that actually music has a, a mood elevating effect in almost every situation that we know. There are very few situations in which people say, 
Well, after having engaged with some music, I felt much worse. So there seems to be some basic property of music which in some sense improves people's situations. So that's a very important baseline. But then you can ask the question, are there some situations in which it improves people's mood more than in others? And the key finding from our research is the importance of choice. One of the things that people hate is the feeling that they're being manipulated. And a real pet hate of people in our studies are pipe music in public places that come out of hidden microphones. So they don't even know where it's coming from. They don't know who's chosen this music, what the people are trying to achieve by playing this music. But if the music is live, I mean, even if it's a street musician, it doesn't have to be someone you've paid to go and hear. You know where the music's coming from. You can see the person, you can see their intent. You can even go up to them, interact with them, ask them to play something else or whatever. So you have much more control in that situation. You can walk away from them and you know the sound will stop eventually. I have a colleague who has data on almost 160,000 surgical and pain patients where they have used music to control pain and anxiety in a variety of medical situations. And when you ask him what kind of music is most effective, his answer is whatever the patient chooses. Each individual human being has, through a history, acquired an emotional resonance to certain kinds of music. They use this music to control pain because it's controlling biochemicals like endorphins, cortisol, interleukin. And though many of those same chemicals are involved in our emotional reaction to music. So now in a quote-unquote healthy, normal person listening to music, the reason you respond to it emotionally is because there are chemicals flooded throughout your body generated by this experience. Someone who's passionate about opera who just loves the opera, who then goes to an opera and is experiencing it, gets a, a strong hit, a strong drug dose, if you will. Uh, these chemicals are being elicited by an experience which is a very powerful and profound one. They wouldn't get that same experience if they were going to a, a jazz concert, for example, or a country western concert. They might enjoy it, but they might not have the same profound experience. And it's even more complicated than that, because the piece of music that makes me happy on one day or one moment. If I rehear it the next day, they make me sad. I would tend to say that the relationship between music and emotion is mediated through the meanings that we ascribe to music. By trying to isolate the bit of emotion that's caused by the music, the sound, we're really hugely simplifying it. Music is a, a rich social, cultural phenomenon, and there is always a social context to any piece of music that you hear. And as much of the emotion is connected to the context as it is to the actual content. I've sometimes been uh, to a concert where the atmosphere in the hall has been absolutely electric and you can just pick up this amazing uh, level of attention and you think, hey, there must be something really good going on and then you get pulled into that. And therefore you feel a much more intense level of emotion than you would if, you, if you'd just been sitting listening to that music at home. One of the early experiments was done where they put uh, people on a treadmill and they asked them to walk on the treadmill which increased in elevation and sped up over time so it gets very very difficult over a period of time and the task was to see how long could they stay on the treadmill so they did it first without music they repeated the experiment then when they had headphones on they could listen to music and they were able to stay on the treadmill for a longer period of time There are another group of researchers headed by Michael Tout, who work with Parkinsonian and stroke patients. 
These are individuals who have a great deal of difficulty in walking and controlling other motor movements such as reaching and grasping. And so he uses what's called rhythmic entrainment or rhythmic auditory stimulation. And over a period of time, these individuals are retrained motor systems, hooking it, if you will, to the rhythmic impulse of, of music. And it would be way too simplistic to say that they learn to march to the music, but essentially they are harnessing motor systems. The rhythmicity of, the, of walking is harnessed to the rhythmic as aspect of the music. And so they can be very successful at uh, regaining uh, walking skills, at learning to pick up a, a cup and taking a drink or to use a fork or a spoon. And so that's another powerful way that, that music has a very strong effect on the body, in this case on the motor systems. Are you from They've begun to do quite a bit of work in geriatrics. And they're looking at the effects of active music making on the aging process and finding out that there are tremendous benefits. When you're involved in active music making, you have a physical benefit because you are breathing and, and blowing and moving and doing all these physical gestures. You have a cognitive aspect because you're very keenly tuned in to and engaged in a, in a high level music uh, a cognitive process. Uh, emotionally, you are expressing and, and being part of something larger than yourself and expressing different emotional things, and socially you're connected because very rarely is this active music making by yourself in isolation. It's almost always with a group. Even if I'm playing music by myself, if I'm playing it for someone else, there's a social interaction. But more often than not, I'm singing in a choir, I'm playing in a band, I'm engaged in a musical uh, outfit. And so for those who are in nursing homes, active music making has the benefit of, of combining emotional and psychological and cognitive and memory and social activation all in one thing that's also very fun and pleasurable. Goodbye to you, farewell my love, soon we'll be sailing to the dawn lady. When we talk about doing music, we actually say playing and that's a pretty good clue as to what we're missing in contemporary, globalized, commodified, capitalistic, corporate, Western culture. It's actually a lot of fun. And I suspect that that's a clue to its evolutionary origins. Music emerges as a mode of interaction for adult humans that has many of the attributes of play for juveniles but that preserves many of the valuable exploratory characteristics that play has. Music provides a mental and bodily play space for people to get together with each other to experience each other as people.